All righty, my clock says 12.03, so we'll get started and let anybody join us um, as we go along. On behalf of the Staff and Faculty Health and Wellbeing Program, I'd like to welcome you to our tour of the grocery store virtually as part of our Healthy Holiday Challenge um, that is coming up on week three that will be um, being released this Friday. Um, our focus this Friday is an exciting one, so I'm not going to do the spoiler alert. Um, so I, I said this is being recorded, so you all realize that. And our guest speaker for today is Kara Constantino, and she is a dietetic intern who is working with me. I'm going to let her introduce herself a little to you as she starts this program. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the question and answer box. Um, you could also put anything in chat as well, and I'll be monitoring those. So welcome, Kara. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much, Linda. And thank you all for joining us today. I know it's especially a holiday week, so I appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us for this tour of the grocery store. Um, so as Linda mentioned, my name is Kara and I'm a dietetic intern working with staff and faculty health and well-being. And today we're going to take a tour through the grocery store and learn about some nutritious picks in each section, as well as how to read a food label. But first, I just wanted to take a quick moment to ask everybody if you're able to stand up Maybe just stretch from your chair, reach up your arms, kind of shake out your hands, roll your neck, maybe a couple shoulder rubs, just to kind of get everybody moving. I know a lot of us are sitting in front of our computers a lot these days and it's not great for us. So I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that and take a couple really big deep breaths. Okay. Um, and I also just wanted to mention, as, as, Lin, as Linda said as well, feel free to you know, let us know if you have any questions. I'm totally fine with being interrupted throughout uh, the tour of the grocery store. If you have questions about any particular topic, definitely feel free to interrupt and let us know. Okay, so um, let's get started. I know the grocery store can be intimidating for some people, and I just wanted to kind of get a sense for how you all feel about the grocery store. Do you feel anxious? Do you feel nervous? Is it something that you enjoy doing? Um, grocery stores have come a long way in the past few decades, and there are so many choices in every aisle, and all those choices can be super overwhelming and confusing. Just to give you a sense, um, according to the Food Marketing Institute, between 1975 and 2008, the number of products in the average supermarket jumped from about 9,000 items all the way to 47,000 items, which is a lot of choices that you have to make when you venture into the grocery store. So today we're gonna try to keep things as simple as possible and give you all the tools that you need to be successful when you head into a grocery store. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a quick poll of the audience and just kind of see where you guys are at with these things. And you do not have to answer these out loud or in the chat. I just wanna get you thinking about your experience with the grocery store. So my first question to you is, do you have a game plan when you go to the grocery store? Is that something that you're used to doing? Do you enjoy going to the grocery store or is it something that you loathe? Do you make a paper list? Do you use an app or do you just wing it when you go? I know that um, I used to wing it, I don't anymore. Um, and are there any sections of the grocery store that you wish you knew more about? Okay, so um, hopefully today, if there are any questions that you have about certain sections, we'll go through that today. Um, all right, so first thing, important thing. I know you've heard this before, but you've definitely heard it for a reason. Um, the key to a successful grocery store trip is planning ahead. So it will take a little bit of extra time, but it will save you money and it can help you make nourishing choices while you're there. So the first thing you wanna do is check your fridge, see what you have available. Check your pantry, see what you have available. 
what can you use that week? And then make a list and stick to it. Um, another really helpful thing is to write down your meal plan um, for the week so that you know what you're gonna be buying at the grocery store. So those are the really important things. Um, I, I know for me personally, like I mentioned, I used to kind of just wing it before I was married, before I had a child. Um, but now I just feel like it just makes my week go so much more smoothly. If I know what we're eating, I have stuff in the fridge and I know what my game plan is. Um, another really important tip that I like is to consider making a, a master list of things that you buy every single week so that you can just start there and you don't have to start over every week. Um, and then just add the things that you're going to be creating with the uh, menu plan that you created for the week. Okay. Any questions so far, Linda? I don't think so. Um, but I'm just going to keep going and feel free to interrupt me if we get there. We're doing good. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so before you leave the house, um, one thing to do is to go over a checklist of things. So have you eaten is a really big question. If not, please consider having a nourishing snack so you're not starving when you enter the store. And I definitely speak from experience that if you are hungry, there's gonna be a lot more spontaneous things that you buy. Um, so have a little snack, grab your list, be sure to grab your reusable bags if you're using them and your store lets you use them. I know now some stores are not letting people use them, but in normal times, we can use our reusable bags. And then um, also, obviously right now we need to grab our masks as well. So um, those are the things that I would recommend doing before you leave the house. Also, before you step into the grocery store aisles, I want to review what a healthy plate looks like. This particular healthy plate was created by Harvard Health and it is intended to be used as a guide for creating balanced meals. So whether it's something that you're serving on a dinner plate or you're packing in your lunchbox, this is what it should look like. Um, Harvard Health suggests putting a copy on your refrigerator just to serve as a reminder um, to see it daily. Um, that this is what your plate should look like. And so if you're shopping at the grocery store, you wanna keep in mind that your cart should all also reflect this. Um, I also wanted to point out that this is a slightly different version than our government's version, which is called My Plate. Some of you may have heard about that before. Um, and if you're interested in reading more about the differences, I would encourage you to look them up online and kind of just check it out. It's a little bit too much to go in today. Um, but we are going to focus on uh, grocery store today. But if you're interested in learning, go for it. Um, so kind of the breakdown of this plate is a half of it should be fruits and veggies, a fourth of it should be healthy protein, and a fourth of it should be whole grains. The other thing this plate highlights is healthy plant oils in moderation. And then they encourage you to drink water, tea, and unsweetened beverages. So they also highlight avoiding sugary beverages, which can be a really easy kind of trap in the grocery store. Um, and so you wanna steer clear of that when you can. Um, another important thing that this plate highlights is staying active, which we're not gonna talk about today, but I did just wanna mention that since it's so important. Um, so this is a great graphic. If you wanna print it out, um, keep it in mind when you're grocery shopping. All right, so we're stepping into the grocery store now and the first section we're gonna check out is the produce section. So most Americans do not eat enough fruits and vegetables. So it's never a bad idea to intake, uh, sorry, to boost your intake of produce. So when you're in the section, you wanna aim for buying a variety of fruits and veggies that are in season if possible. We are lucky these days that we get all kinds of fruit and veggies all year but it's great to choose the ones that are in season. And if you wanna learn more about what produce is in season, I would encourage you to visit seasonalfoodguide.org. They have a great section about, you know, which, which fruit and veggies are in season for, I think they break it down by month or season, I can't remember, but it's a great, um, great tool to use. While you're there, you also wanna look for deeply colored fruits and veggies for the most nutrient dense produce. I would also encourage you to discover new fruits and veggies. So don't be afraid to challenge yourself and try something new. It might look different or you may never have heard of it, but with the internet, we're really lucky. We can look up all sorts of recipes and you can just type it right in and find out what can I do with this. 
Um, another pro tip here is to don't forget about frozen fruits and veggies. They are just as nutritious as fresh. And sometimes they can even be less expensive. And the great thing is you can keep them in your freezer. They won't go bad until you need them. Um, and then also don't forget about canned fruits and veggies. Those are great as well. Um, they are shelf stable and they can last a long time, which is great, especially now when we don't wanna be going to the grocery store as often as we're used to. Any questions at all for the produce section today? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Moving on to dairy. So this is a really broad category. Um, we'll start with kind of talking about what it's best to choose. So typically it's best to choose a low fat or non-fat item such as non-fat milk, low fat cottage cheese, and also low fat yogurt. And the dairy section is a great source of high quality protein. And there's also a lot of excellent portable snacks in this section. Can you guys think of anything in the dairy section that you could use as a portable snack that you might, um, you know, grab and go? Is there anything you guys can think of? And again, you don't necessarily have to say it out loud, but maybe throw it in the chat or is it something that you use? Um, I see I know. string cheese coming through. Uh, can you see the chat, Kara? I can, but you know what? It's so much better if you don't yeah. mind just reading it to me. Yeah. That would be Hard great. boiled eggs is another great idea. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I love the string cheese um, ideas too. And then they also have um, sticks of like cheddar cheese as well. So they've broadened from just the kind of uh, string cheese. Oh, cottage cheese also. I haven't had that for a long time. <laughs> Love that. Yep. Cottage cheese and yogurt are great ones. Love that. Um, so it's just kind of my point is it's a, you know, it has so much uh, possibilities in terms of what you can grab when you're looking for something healthy, but you're also on the go and you're in a hurry. So keep that in mind. The other thing I just wanted to dive into a little bit is milk alternatives because there are so many of them out there these days. So whether you have a lactose intolerance or maybe you just prefer not to drink cow's milk, um, these days there's so many alternatives. So let's just briefly talk through a couple of the um, most popular and most common ones. So almond milk. Um, almond milk is lower in calories than cow's milk, but you need to keep in mind that it also has very little protein. Um, for one cup, it just has one gram per cup as compared to cow's milk, which has about eight grams per cup. Um, so just keep that in mind. You're, you know, it's okay to use almond milk, but if you're trying to compare the cow's milk, the protein is very different. Um, also, almond milks are typically fortified with vitamins and other nutrients. Um, but some don't contain vitamin D or calcium, calcium like cow's milk. So just to keep in mind for your health goals, check those out if those are lacking in your diet. Um, soy milk is another super popular non-dairy substitute. And I think it's been kind of the leading one for decades now, mostly because its nutrition profile resembles cow's milk as closely as you know any of the milk alternatives so far. So soy milk has about seven grams of protein per cup, which is just one gram less than cow's milk. Um, but keep in mind that not all brands are fortified with calcium and vitamin D. So just make sure to take a look at the nutrition label and look for these values. And that's something we're gonna talk about later in the presentation as well. Another really popular one right now is oat milk. Um, oat milk actually does pretty good in the protein category. It has about five grams of protein per cup, which is getting closer to the cow's milk. Um, and it has no saturated fat, which is a bonus for some people who are watching their fat. The other thing about oatmeal, uh, oat milk that's unique and a nice bonus is it has 1.9 grams of fiber. All right, so jumping into coconut milk, which is also kind of trendy these days. Coconut milk is creamy and sweet, and this milk offers 30% of your daily value of vitamin D, which is great, and 50% of your daily value of vitamin B12. Um, it does not contain very much calcium, and it only has one gram of protein per cup. 
So, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses for each alternative milk. Um, and you just gotta kind of weigh the ones that work well for you, what tastes good for you and, and you know, what works with your health goals. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about coconut milk that's important is that it does contain as much saturated fat as whole cow's milk. So just keep that in mind if you're watching your saturated fat, coconut milk um, can raise there. The last thing I wanted to say on this slide is that calcium and vitamin D are often lacking in American diets and dairy can definitely help boost that. So um, those are kind of, you know, when you're thinking through your diet and your balance, remember that dairy is great to boost those two things. Um, I did want to talk about yogurt uh, on its own slide and yogurt gets its own slide because there's so many options and it can be very confusing to choose a yogurt. I know when I went to the grocery store yesterday, the yogurt section really just takes over almost the dairy section at this point. Um, so how do we navigate all these options? And I just want to start with the basics. Should you choose fruited, flavored, or plain? Keep in mind that added sugar is a very common ingredient in fruited and flavored varieties of yogurt. So I would recommend that you skip those and just choose a plain yogurt and then you can add your own toppings. So you can control the sweetness and how much sugar or honey or agave, whatever it is you wanna sweeten it with, you choose it. And then you can also add things like fruit, honey, granola, nuts, cinnamon, vanilla, kind of the toppings are endless, but it's a great base and it's a great healthy base. Um, so some tips for on what to look for when you're choosing a yogurt. I would say ideally the protein is more than the sugar. It has less than 12 grams of sugar and there's no artificial sweeteners, which, you know, some people choose to eat those. I think if you can, it's a good idea just to stick with the plain and that way you don't even have to, you can sidestep those artificial sweeteners. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that when you read the nutrition facts label on a plain yogurt, you will still see that it has sugar, even though no sugar has been added. And this is because even in plain yogurt contains lactose, which is the naturally occurring sugar in milk. So keep in mind, you will still see some sugar, but it will have no added sugar if you get the plain yogurt. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention on yogurt is Greek yogurt, just because that has been so trendy the past few years and is still right now. So Greek yogurt is strained and this process makes it thicker and creamier and smoother than a traditional yogurt. It has typically double the protein of traditional yogurt, but it does have some reduced calcium. So you can keep that in mind. Um, in both traditional and Greek yogurts, bacteria cultures help to break down the lactose so some yogurt is actually easier to um, digest if someone is lactose intolerant. And Greek yogurt just overall has less, has less lactose than traditional yogurt. So if you happen to be lactose sensitive, this might be a good choice. I love Greek yogurt personally, the plain kind, because it can be a great sub in baking and cooking. We use it on things like, you know, if we have Taco Tuesday, we might use that as a sub for sour cream. I've used it to add creaminess to soups. You guys might have your own ideas of things that you um, might sub it in for. You can make some great salad dressings, things like that. So highly recommend Greek yogurt, looking for the plain version. Any questions so far about that? Let's see. Sorry, I was trying to find the unmute. Um, That's okay. Gara, we do have a question. Okay. Um, when you refer to less than 12 grams of sugar, are you referring to per serving or per container? Per serving. Yes. Good question. So most of the kind of single serves um, will have the entire container, but if you're getting a larger version, you want to look for per serving um, of 12 grams of sugar. Does that answer, Grilda? Hopefully. Great. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And then the last thing I wanted to say about yogurt is you may want to consider being wary of light or non-fat yogurts. And the reason for that is they have added thickeners, gelatin, gum, starch, sweeteners, and flavorings to make it more appetizing and more palatable. So, you know, when they take out the fat, they also take, you know, they put in something and usually it's sugar. 
So those tend to be higher in sugar or higher in ad additives. So, you know, it's something that you can choose, but just keep in mind that there will be um, things that you may not want in a light or non-fat yogurt. All right, so let's move on to our next section, which is the exciting fish and seafood section. So the American Heart Association recommends eating two servings of fatty fish like salmon, herring, albacore, tuna um, a week. And this helps reduce the risk of congestive heart failure, coronary heart disease and stroke, especially when the seafood replaces less healthy foods. Um, when you are choosing a fish and seafood, it's important to remember to choose a uh, fish that is low in mercury whenever possible. So I wanted to highlight a few uh, fish that are high in mercury that it's best to avoid. Big eye tuna, gulf tilefish, king mackerel, marlin, and orange ruffy. So those are high in mercury and you don't want to eat those very often or at all if possible. Um, if you're choosing fish at the fish counter, you want to choose a fish that smells um, fresh and not overly fishy. It looks bright. It looks fresh. And if your store happens to have someone behind the counter, you can always ask them what's fresh. But if you're doing it on your own, you just want to look for those tips of the bright and looking fresh. Um, another great tip for fish is to choose canned fish like salmon, which is a great cost saving option. I know fish is super expensive and not everybody has the money to buy it all the time. I personally have a really hard time um, getting the, you know, enough uh, seafood per week. So I really rely on the canned fish um, often. Um, one of the reasons that the American Heart Association recommends eating these fatty fish is that they contain the all important omega-3 fatty acids. So what do you do if you don't eat fish or you don't eat seafood? How, how do you get those, uh, the fatty acids? Um, well, the good news is you can choose some other items. So you can choose things like nuts and seeds, such as flaxseed, chia seeds, and walnuts. You can choose plant oils, such as flaxseed oil, soybean oil, and canola oil. And then you can also choose fortified foods. A lot of foods these days are, um, a lot, a lot of foods these days are fortified with the omega-3s, such as eggs, yogurt, juices, milk, soy beverages, and even infant formula these days are fortified with that. Okay, moving on to poultry and meat, unless there's any questions about the fish. We do actually have a question, Kara. Mm -hmm. um, if you know off the top of your head information about farm-raised versus wild fish. Yeah, that's such a good question. And, you know, I have to say I'm not an expert in that yet. So still working on the difference between those. Um, Linda, do you have any... Thing that you would say or were, I would be happy to find out more information for Grilda and get back to her. Yeah, you know, my knowledge is not terribly updated. Um, I kept up on it more several years ago, um, but the, um, the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch program website might be a great place to get information. And I know that farmed fish often is a source of pollution and it also utilizes harvests from the ocean to feed these massive col colonies of fish that we're farming. So it's definitely not always a great choice. So I think there is, like you said, Kara, there's a lot of information on that. So we'll do yeah. some research on that. Great yeah. question. Yeah, really great question. And, and would be happy to dive into that a little bit further and get back to you if that's okay. All right. Um, so why don't we go ahead and jump into poultry and meat section. So when you're looking at poultry, so turkey and chicken, you want to shoot for buying that without skin, or you can always take the skin off after cooking, which I tend to do more often because it kind of seals the flavors in for you, but, but either is a great choice. Um, and when you're choosing beef, I would recommend choosing lean cuts of beef whenever you can, whenever that's possible. Lean cuts of beef include round chuck, sirloin, and tenderloin. And then there's lean pork or lamb includes tenderloin, loin chop, and leg. 
Um, my pro tip here is that if you happen to go to a store that has a butcher, you can always ask them to trim the fat for you or even suggest the right cuts of meat for what you're looking to do. Um, I've found that they can be really helpful in terms of, you know, if you let them know you're making a stew or in, but you want it to not be fatty or you're, you know, you're making a chili, but you want to choose kind of a, um, a cut of beef that's budget friendly, but also doesn't have a lot of fat. They, they tend to have a lot of good answers. So if you're lucky enough to have a store that has a butcher, definitely uh, utilize that and uh, ask questions. Um, a little bit more on poultry and meat. There's not really a specific recommendation for the amount of meat and poultry you should have per week as it's a personal choice. But when you do eat it, it's a great idea to choose leaner versions whenever possible and then save that higher fat option as an occasional indulgence rather than kind of a regular thing. Some things you wanna pay attention to when you're choosing poultry and meat. Um, in terms of the ground poultry, you wanna check for Sorry, I wanna go ahead and start with the ground meat. When you're buying ground beef, look for packages with the highest percentage of lean meat. So usually somewhere around the 90% uh, range is great if you can find that. And then when you're looking for uh, ground turkey or ground chicken, to make the leanest choice possible, it's a good idea to choose ground breast meat or just look for a minimum of 90% lean ground chicken or turkey. Um, and the reason for that is ground uh, poultry can sometimes have as much fat as ground beef when it includes dark meat or skin. So just something to keep in mind, look for the percentages when you're picking out those ground items. Um, and then when you're picking out beef, I would encourage you to be selective and choose beef that is labeled choice or select instead of prime, which usually has a bit more fat. Um, and then I just wanted to mention that the Mayo Clinic suggests that you try to choose fresh over processed meats whenever possible. And the reason for that is that processed meats are preserved by smoking, curing, salting, or preservatives and chemicals. So you just really wanna limit the frequency and amount of processed meat, such as sausages, deli meats, and bacon to about one ounce, no more than a few times a month. So looking at those types of meats as a little bit more of an indulgence, if possible. Just throwing that tip out there for you guys. Any questions about that? I don't see any in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on to vegetarian protein options, which I love this slide. I'm not actually a vegetarian, but I eat a lot of vegetarian protein items for, you know, mostly for taste, but also, um, you know, just sometimes it's easier, sometimes it can be cheaper. Um, so here's some options for those of us who enjoy eating that way. Nuts and seeds, peanut butter, almond butter, beans, peas and lentils, bags of dry beans can be a great, um, they can be much more economical than buying canned beans, but canned beans are great for convenience. So sometimes you want to make a soup that night and you don't have time to soak the beans. So canned beans are great. Just make sure you rinse them to get rid of the sodium. I would also encourage you to experiment with soy proteins like edamame, tofu, and tempa. They're really kind of fun to make. And, and like I said in the beginning, the nice thing about the internet these days is you can just type in, you know, how do I make tempa? What recipes can I make with tempa? What is tempa? <laughs> Things like that. Um, so just be, you know, be adventurous with your protein options. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, Remember that you need to get your vitamin B12 from another source. And the reason for that is vitamin B12 is naturally only found in animal products. So you can choose fortified foods such as cereals or soy products or take a vitamin B12 supplement if you do not cons uh, consume any animal products. So always just check the label if you're trying to up your vitamin um, B12 if you're not eating any animal products, something to keep in mind. All right, I don't see any questions. So I'm gonna move on to one of my favorite categories, which is grains. So grains have gotten a really bad rap over the years, but they're actually part of enjoying a, a healthful diet and you wanna include them in your diet. And the grain category includes things like cereals, bread, rice, pasta. Um, and when you're choosing a whole grain, um, remember that it's, it's helping reduce the risk of 
chronic disease. So it's a great way to reduce your risk of these chronic diseases by aiming for at least three to five servings of whole grains per day. Um, and you just wanna look for the first ingredient should be whole grains or whole wheat or whole whatever you're eating of that grain should be the very first ingredient. Um, I would also encourage you to incorporate grains you maybe haven't eaten before into your diet. And these are a couple uh, ideas, wild rice, barley, farro, bulgur, quinoa, spelt, rye, corn, millet. Do you guys use any of those? Are you open to trying new grains? I know sometimes we kind of get stuck in a rut and maybe we don't um, buy new things at the store, but it's a great idea to kind of mix up your diet and they all contain different nutrients, uh, vitamins. So I would encourage you to get, you know, get excited about new grains and get adventurous because they, they can be really fun. Okay. So I also wanted to kind of highlight this great graphic, um, which was by pa Harvard Public Health, and it shows you what a whole grain looks like and what a refined grain looks like. So there's definitely room in your diet for both, but you just want to stick to whole grain whenever possible. And you can see from this cool graphic that the germ and the bran are stripped off the grain when the products are processed. So when you take that germ and you take that bran off, you lose a lot of nutrients like B vitamins, vitamin E, healthy fats and minerals. So this is just a good visual for you to remember when you're buying grains. Um, you know, Remember if you're buying the whole grain, you got all the good stuff, you're buying the refined grain, it's kind of a naked grain. I hope that visual helps. Um, okay, so cereal is a huge part of the grain uh, category. It is a very popular breakfast item and because there's so many options to choose from, it can be very overwhelming to choose a cereal that's healthy for you. I know, again, when I went to the grocery store yesterday, literally the entire aisle at Safeway is cereal. So it, it takes over the entire aisle. Um, my fun cereal fact is, did you guys know that Cheerios is the best selling cereal in the United States and there are currently 19 types of Cheerios, which is insane, um, but also cool. I love Cheerios and it's kind of fun to try new versions, but always take a peek at the back of the label and, and check out the sugars, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So here is my cheat sheet for choosing a healthy cereal. Um, for sugars, you want to aim for five grams or less per serving, fiber, three to five grams or more per serving, fat, you want to shoot for three grams of fat or less per serving, and then vitamins and minerals, we're looking for calcium, vitamin D, folic acid, and vitamin C, although I will say I think almost all uh, cereals are fortified with these uh, vitamins and nutri nutrients now, but it is possible uh, that you know, there might be one that's not. In terms of the ingredient list, I would recommend that the list should begin with whole grain or whole wheat if you're shooting for a healthful cereal. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions? All right. So I wanna just show you guys that when I went to the grocery store yesterday, I, cut, I took these pictures and I just wanna highlight them. You don't have to strain your eyes to see them, but I just kind of wanted to show you what, this is what you do. When you're at the grocery store, you literally just turn it around, flip it around and scan for those items. So the, in this particular example, Cheerios has a serving size of one and a half cups, 140 calories, two grams of sugar, five grams of fiber and two and a half grams of fat. So this one would meet our criteria. The other one is Lucky Charms, which their serving size is one cup. So you'll notice that's less than the Cheerios. I think the Cheerios is definitely kind of more on par with what people are actually eating and it has the same amount of calories, but less uh, cereal. It has 12 grams of sugar, which is just a lot of sugar. And so I would recommend that you probably save that for either, you know, an occasional indulgence, but not an everyday thing, because that's a lot of sugar. It does not have very much fiber and it does have 1.5 grams of fat, which is not bad. It just, the, the other things are kind of what get you for Lucky Charms. Um, okay, so on the next slide, we're gonna take a close up look of a nutrition label. And I wanted to ask you guys, you know, if thumbs up or thumbs down, how many of you guys regularly read nutrition labels? And it's totally okay if you don't. <laughs> um, 
I don't read them all the time either. I think that it is a great habit to get into. I see a couple of people are raising their hands, which is awesome. Um, but if you don't, that's okay. And I think, you know, my goal today is just to show you that it really can be easy just to kind of scan a few things and um, be a little bit more informed about the choices that you're making. Um, so let's kind of just walk through this a little bit. So the serving size is a single serving listed in measurements uh, that are standard, such as cups or pieces. And the label also lists the total number of servings in the container. So you just want to be sure to check the serving size against how much you're actually eating. Calories are listed in the amount of calories in one serving of the food. So you can use this information to compare similar products and choose the one that works best for your health goals. And then you'll also notice nutrients and daily values. The label lists the amount of fat, cholesterol, sodium, carbohydrates, fiber, sugar, protein, vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium in one serving. So the daily value will tell you how close you are to meeting the requirements based on a 2000 calorie diet. The other thing that you'll notice is that um, the tip, uh, the nutrients to increase are listed on here because the typical American diet is low in fiber. It's low in vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium. So the reason that they're listed here is to encourage Americans to include more of these important nutrients in their diet. This is the new label that's coming out. I don't know if it's actually out already. I don't know if you know that, Linda. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So they changed it just a little bit. They kind of increased the font size on the calories so that it stands out. And then they bolded certain things that are important. Any questions about that? And the other thing um, before I see about the questions, if you want to learn more about this, I have kind of a little link on the bottom there um, at eatright.org. They have even more kind of a deep dive of information if you wanna get into reading food labels a little bit more. We did have a couple of questions about cereal, Kara. Okay. One of them is the five grams of sugar according to the old label or the new label that has the larger portion size. Um, specifically on the Cheerios one or just in general, do we know? I don't know if these are the new labels or not. So no. this, I would say either or. Um, I don't know that the portion size has changed that much. Um, what do you think, Kara? I, I would be okay with just saying five grams of sugar. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you just have to look at whatever serving size they currently have listed. So for this particular, so for example, on the Cheerios box, they have one and a half cups. So in one and a half cups, there's two grams of sugar. So if you're having double that, if you're having three cups of sugar or three cups of uh, Cheerios, you'd have four grams of sugar. So I would say really just to focus on the serving size listed on whatever you're looking at. And then the sugar should be uh, accurate for that serving size. Does that kind of help? Yeah, so that's a basic guideline. And you can see some of the cereals get awfully high in sugar like that, Lucky Charms. The next question actually might apply to Lucky Charms because it says, what about food dyes in cereals? Are mm. those safe? That's a good question. I, you know, I think that's really, uh, it, it boils down to a personal choice is what I would say. Um, certain people are okay to have dyes and certain people are not. Any food that is in, any dye that is in a um, grocery store in the USA, um, I believe that they, you know, they're using uh, only items that are certified as safe. So in terms of kind of an umbrella, I would say, yes, it's safe. However, some people choose to, um, you know, take that in and some people choose to stay away from that. Um, it looks like Linda's sharing the environmental working group, which is great. Um, and they can list the health implications for you. But personally, I think, you know, and I, I don't know if you would agree with me, Linda, I think it, it boils down to kind of a personal choice and what you are okay ingesting and what you're not okay ingesting. Okay. All right. Anybody else? 
We have a question about the availability of a cheat sheet for selecting a variety of products in the grocery store. The handout will send that. Oh, that was you. Great. Okay. Awesome. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on to the bulk section. So I know not every grocery store has a bulk section, but if your grocery store does, I, it's great to take advantage of. They have a lot of great options like oats, nuts, beans, lentils, whole grain flours, that type of thing. Um, and the only thing is it is easy to go overboard here. So start small and make nutritious choices that work for you and your family. Um, another great uh, tip that Linda actually gave me uh, about this section is that you can just try a little bit of something new, which is very cool. So if you wanted to try, you know, just a half a cup of a seed or a flower or, you know, some different spice that you haven't tried before, you don't have to buy a huge thing of it. You can buy a little bit, test it out, see if you like it. And that way you save a little bit of money. So I love that. Um, there's a lot of healthful and sustainable options uh, in the bulk section. So take advantage of it if you are able. Um, okay, canned goods. So the canned good aisle is full of budget friendly options. They have canned vegetables, canned fruits, canned seafood and canned beans. Um, and just keep in mind that canned foods can be just as nutritious as fresh and frozen because canning preserves many nutrients and the amount of minerals, fat, cellular vitamins, protein, fat, and carbohydrates remain the same. So it's a great option, especially now when we're not going to the grocery store as much, they're shelf stable. You can use them, you know, if you want to throw in some beans to a salad to add some protein or some veggies, canned is is terrific. And we already talked a little bit about the canned seafood, but it is on this list as well. So I would definitely encourage you to give those a try if, if they're not currently in your kind of grocery store master list, check them out. It's a great um, budget friendly aisle. Kara, we do have a question about canned seafood. And okay. would you recommend the kind in water or the kind in oil? And if it's in oil, what kind of oil? Ooh, good question. Um, I would say typically water is best just because that is kind of the, the lower fat version. I know there are some um, tunas that are canned in oil that might be good for certain dishes. Um, I would say maybe save those for kind of uh, more of an occasional rather than always. But again, it, it's, it really is a personal choice for what works for your health goals. So someone might want that extra olive oil in their salad that they're making. But I think in general, it's probably best to stick to seafood that's canned in water. Would you agree with that, Linda? I'm, that, that one's a little... I definitely would. And as long as it's in a vegetable or a marine oil, I think it's fine. I don't know that they would be canned in anything that had been too processed. Yeah, that's a great question. I think kind of along those lines too, I have this on the slide, but when you're choosing fruit, you want to kind of steer clear of the ones that have added syrup and definitely stick to water or 100% juice. And then the veggies, check out low sodium or no salt options. Um, and when you are using canned beans, it's a great idea just to rinse them to, to drain that extra sodium off if you can. Okay, any other questions on canned stuff? All right. Well, congratulations, everybody. We made it through the grocery store tour together. Um, and I hope this presentation gave you some helpful tips about kind of how to have a successful trip to the store. There is so much marketing that goes on in every single grocery store to try to get you to buy certain items. And it really is human nature to succumb to that marketing sometimes. So don't beat yourself up if you do. Um, but I hope that if you go into the grocery store now, you'll have your list, you'll have your plan, and you'll be more likely to stick with that um, versus making spontaneous purchases if you don't have a plan. Um, so those are my tips for the grocery store. So we do and, have another question. Oh, good, okay. Um, how important is it to buy organic produce? So that's, that's the million dollar question always. Um, mm -hmm. I think, Personally, I would say that that is a personal choice. I don't think it's that important to buy organic. I think it's more important to focus on adding fruits and vegetables to your diet. 
don't let the organic be a barrier. I think organic fruits and vegetables are, they can be very expensive. If you have the, the money to buy them and you enjoy them, I would say that's great. I don't think people need to focus only on organic because it can be, you know, cost prohibitive for some people. And um, it, it, it starts to be an inequality issue. Um, and so, you know, if there's certain foods that you, you feel strongly you want to buy organic, great. I don't think it is crucial. That would be my personal answer. But again, it's, it's a very personal choice um, and kind of a hot button topic. Um, but I would say to, it's more important to get those veggies and fruit in to your body and get the nutrients rather than focus on, is it organic or not organic? I completely agree with you, Kara. You know, and it may be one thing as we move forward and it becomes less expensive to be certified organic, but currently it's such an expense for growers to become and maintain yeah. that organic um, certification. And the research shows there might be a little tiny bit of extra nutrients, but like Kara said, it's so much more important for us to just eat fruits and vegetables and boy, the cost. I bought cauliflower, a head of cauliflower for $4.99 for one or, and the only reason I bought organic is because the $1.99 conventional, oh, it didn't come in today and I really needed cauliflower. So, yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Any other questions at all? I think, did we cover all the ones that came in? I think we covered all the ones that came in. So okay. yes, and we will definitely send out um, the cheat sheet. Kara, I, I haven't shared it with you, but I have it from a previous presentation that could be handy. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so okay. we can send that out afterwards. Okay, well, thank you guys all so much for taking this virtual tour through the grocery store with us. And I hope you feel more confident about your food choices and food labels. And if you aren't, if you weren't comfortable speaking up today, or if you think of another question, definitely feel free to shoot us an email at wellbeing at ucdavis.edu and someone will get back to you. And then the only other thing I wanted to highlight um, is that we will be sending out a survey shortly uh, and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. So any feedback that you have for us about how to make presentations better or anything that you're interested in seeing moving forward, definitely feel free to reach out.